yeah, I'm going to talk today about game art style, hopefully a little bit about Skyrim, but not a whole lot. Um, and uh, I hope you guys still like what I have to say. This is a topic that I really uh, enjoy, um, and it's kind of a big topic. There's no way to really encompass it in one talk. So this is really my, my take on it. This is the way I think about art style and games. Um, before we get into that, a little bit about me. I work at Bethesda Game Studios. And we released Skyrim last year. Um, I did a, some concept art and some character art on that. Before that I worked at EA's Mythic Studio on Warhammer Online. Uh, concept art, character art, some UI stuff. And a long time ago I got my start doing uh, plug-in player models for uh, Quake 3 Arena. Um, it's a little rough to look at, but uh, so I, as I understand, there's a lot of students here today, uh, and uh, sometimes people are interested in sort of passing the industry. That's why I mentioned this kind of stuff. And uh, for me, there is there's one common thread for all of this was which is the online forum Polycount, which is where I learned most of what uh, I know about game art. So if you're interested in being a game artist. I highly recommend it. Go there, post your work, listen to what people have to say, and you'll learn a lot. So let's talk about game art style. It's kind of a, a fiddly term. I don't like the way it sounds coming out, but you know, I was trying to think about how to describe what I want to talk about. I thought maybe aesthetics is the right word. Uh, but that really encompasses more than just visual art. You can say, that game mechanics and audio and music are part of the aesthetic of a game. And I really want to talk about the visual art, plus this is how gamers talk about it these days, is this Penny Arcade comic shows. It was based off of this Namco um, survey when they were trying to figure out what to do with Pac-Man next. To start off a little history, um, when I was a kid and playing video games in the 80s with my friends, uh, we didn't say art style. When we talked about games, we said graphics. What are the graphics like? And, you know, ads would talk about graphics. This is the famous video game Donkey King um, for full graphic screens. The SNES had power graphics. Um, but we hear people talk about art style more these days, and I think that that shows that uh, art style matters to gamers. Um, and it's sometimes hard to, to understand why style matters, and I'll certainly try and give you my opinion. Um, to me, it's, it's kind of like a great song. You know, there's a lot of ways to make sound, um, but a bunch of sound coming together doesn't make a great song. It has to, to blend and you know, it has to work together. And I thought about showing a clip of a of a, a symphony playing music together, and then I remembered this clip from Hustle and Flow. Um, so whether you like that music or not, it has tons of style, and. Uh, I like how they layer pieces on. It's kind of like a game where you've got your backgrounds and you layer your characters and you layer uh, your UI. And like freestyle hip hop, it's all happening in real time. It's all off the cuff. Um, so that's probably stretching that metaphor a little too far, but I just wanted to play that clip. Um, I like to look at games that have a long lineage that existed in every generation, like Metal Gear and Mario. And uh, way back in the day, the guys making this art, they had to struggle. You know, it was it's really difficult to take a 16 pixel block and make it look like a person, like a character. Um, it's hard to see, but Mario has thumbs, which I think is a major achievement for that artist. Um, it's it's really hard to do. Um, making pixel art was sort of like trying to paint a canvas with Legos. And so a lot of the games look pretty similar. 
um, they were the artists were so technically constrained on those platforms. Uh, and as more console generations came about, more opportunities opened up for the artists. Um, but you can see this art style really starting to come forward in these titles, and their gameplay, of course, was differentiating as well, um, especially with the jump to 3D. And they ended up in very different places, and it, I think this shows sort of the expansion that uh, came about as far as the territory that's available to game artists. Um, and even though they jumped to 3D, there still are a lot of 2D Mario games, which look different from the original 2D Mario games. So I think this shows how much style has opened up with the modern hardware and uh, game engines, and there's this huge style landscape. And my favorite way to, to map this style landscape comes from Scott McCloud's book, Understanding Comics. Um, this is his style triangle. He calls it a couple other things. And he's on here he's plotting different comics according to how they sort of lay out based on these three corners. He's got uh, reality, abstraction, he's calling that the picture plane on this image, and meaning. And for comics, meaning was blending images and text. It's a quick example. So reality would be like a realistic picture of a face, a photo of a face. Uh, abstraction from our Penny Arcade comic, maybe Cubist Impressionism. And meaning two dots in a line. And Scott makes the point in his book that you can draw two dots in a line and show it to anybody from any culture, anybody anywhere in the world, and they'll say that's a face. Uh, so that's sort of the purest meaning drawing you can come up with there. So to apply this to games, if uh, we use racing games as an example, because racing games don't have characters and they don't have to worry about the uncanny valley. Down here you would have something like Forza, which is sort of a trying to give you a real racing experience. Up top you might have something like Res, and down here something like Line Rider, which is purely about uh, the complex mechanics you can create by drawing these simple lines. So any sort of style I think would get in the way of of the fun of Line Rider. So revisiting our history for a second. Here's what I showed you from Mario and Metal Gear before. And if you kind of flip it, I think it sort of maps to the triangle like this. You might start the NES stuff a little higher on that edge, but again, it shows how the territory sort of opened up over time. And it's good, Mario, with the way it did, because I think it would have been pretty bad if it had gone too far down into realism <laughs> corner. What am I here? Lots of um, games are very keen to get down into realism corner down here. And I think we need to think about why is it so, why is it so many games are trying to get down there? And I think a lot of people see it as the kind of the tip of the spear as far as the highest quality video game experiences. Um, they imagine that the more real the games look, the, the more real they will feel, and that's the best way to sort of increase the immersion. Um, and uh, we also see a lot of these live action and pre-rendered game trailers. And then when you play the games, you know, wonder why don't they do the same approach for the storytelling bits in the games? And yeah, it's more expensive to do the commercials, but that's not all of it. Uh, we work very hard as game developers to kind of smooth out the transitions between the storytelling bits in the game and the gameplay bits. We want it to feel like one cohesive experience. And that means you have to match it with the gameplay. And gameplay can't get down into realism corner. If you had a game that was fully simulated, felt totally real, had every detail, it would be real life. It wouldn't be a game anymore. So gameplay is sort of um, fundamentally abstract, at least to a certain degree. 
Um, gameplay will always be a, a stylized version of reality, and so we need to consider art style in that context. Uh, as game artists, we talk about this all the time. We see movies, and we look at things like Gollum and the Navi, and we say, you know, maybe in the next generation with the new Unreal Engine, games can look that good. Um, they can be that realistic. Well, first of all, these characters aren't realistic humans. Um, but that point is that point holds, and I and I and I agree to a certain point. We will have little movies in our games that look this good, um, and there's lots of game makers that are carrying the, that torch and making great games doing it, like uh, Heavy Rain on the top and L.A. Noir down here on the bottom. Um, but the challenge that these games have is when the player takes over and takes the controller, it, it's challenging for them to, to blend those two things together. If you want to have any interactivity in your games at all, it's going to fight with your carefully authored animation or storytelling. And these seams take a lot of work to blend. And this is, uh, well, narrative and gameplay are just sort of strange bedfellows. And this is why style is so important. Style allows us as artists to craft an abstract reality an internally meaningful reality that if we deliver it with a consistent steady hand uh, it creates this feeling of, of believability the suspension of disbelief immersion um, and it's kind of a state of mind where it all feels real as game developers we create this impression by aligning the gameplay and the art style they've got to be doing the same thing going to the same place, which brings us back to the triangle. You can plot your gameplay on the triangle and use that as a guidepost to help think about what's the art style for your game. Is your game deep simulation, like Skyrim? Is it crisp fun, like Triple Town? Your art style must align to that gameplay. So you have to uh, make specific choices about how to portray your game worlds. Um, and to get started with that, a great place to start is inspiration, reference points. And since we've learned that uh, video games have a relatively short history of art and pretty technically constrained at that, it's a great idea to broaden your, your search and look at other media. Um, so I'm not going to tell you how to be inspired. It's up to each individual artist to decide what they think is beautiful. I think as artists we all sort of do that naturally anyway. Um, what I want to do instead is give you some bad news about stuff you're not allowed to do in video games. Um, but hopefully, given that, you can uh, find interesting new approaches that are a great fit for games. So let's start with uh, film and photography. Uh, when we look at film as a source of inspiration. There's a lot that doesn't really work. Like the guy in the chair, the director, that's the player. The actors in a video game are either going to be other players or they're going to be controlled by AI and they're never going to approach a Hollywood level of believability performance in video games dynamically. Um, the little movies will, but the gameplay bits, uh, it's not really going to be the same kind of thing. Um, but if we look at the, the cinematography in particular, there's a ton of inspiration to be found, a ton of reference. Um, there's a, the director of photography has a, a big impact on the visual style of a film. Uh, as an example, in the last generation of consoles, there were a lot of games that looked at Saving Private Ryan and wanted to duplicate this bleach bypass effect. Uh, Gears of War to be won. Um, but there are challenges as well. Uh, for a cinematographer, they can skip the bleach and they get that nice nuanced look. And for video games, programmers have to take a lot of time to kind of replicate this effect that we sort of get for free with film. And that goes for a lot of other things like atmospheric perspective, 
bloom, ambient occlusion, bounce lighting, dynamic vegetation, and on and on. And generally speaking, the whole beautiful complexity of, of life that can be captured by a camera, we have to try and recreate by hand in video games, including set design and costume design, where they have real world materials to, to pull that stuff together. It's not always so easy for us. So keep that in, t in mind the next time you hear a game artist say they want their game to look like this movie, say, Kingdom of Heaven. Uh, unless they have infinite programmers and infinite time, they're going to have to make choices, hard choices, about what they're pulling. And by making those choices, they're defining a style. Uh, if we look at 3D animation, it, like video games, is created from scratch. The, the people making these movies have to build everything up. Uh, a lot of the, the beauty that we get in, in some of these films comes from effects that are expensive to render and can take hours to render a frame. And of course, in video games, we have to render at least 30 frames a second. Um, subsurface scattering, fluid simulation, cloth, things like that. Um, but we can still look at this stuff and occasionally, like on Jack-Jack's ear, there's subsurface scattering. We can do a cheaper version of that in games and maybe hide it with a noisy texture and get a pretty good result. Um, so it's, it's good to look at that stuff, but it's, it's not a slam dunk. Illustration is perhaps the, the richest vein of inspiration. There's, there's so much of it, um, and it's, there's so much stylistic variety as well. Um, but a lot of what can make a great illustration great is dependent on composition. And of course, in a video game, composition is largely under the control of the player holding the camera. And there are compositional tricks that illustrators use, like softening edges, um, putting atmospheric perspective wherever they need to, focusing on shapes and things like that um, to pull off an effect. This is a, a fantastic painting by Tom Scholz that you might use to set the tone for a game, but you wouldn't necessarily use it to design the world by. Shadows can hide things. Um, but you can it's still a great source of inspiration. As a side note, if you've got a 2D game, the backgrounds are a great opportunity to use illustration um, to a you know, wonderful effect, because it's essentially not playable space. You can paint it and come up with uh, some really striking art styles. Drawn animation um, has sort of the problems of illustration and the problems of 3D animation. Um, and a lot of the beauty that you can get in drawn animation is sort of coming from the animator's hand. And in video games, the player's hand takes precedence over the animator's hand. So if the player hits the punch button, the punch happens right away. There's no anticipation on that movement. Um, and if you, you guys are familiar, if you're running around in a video game with a character and you change directions, the, the character changes direction. There's not a lot of sense of momentum and weight to that movement. And if you try and layer a lot of hand-drawn elements in a 3D world, often you can get a noisy composition. That said, there are, there are successes. Uh, Mark of the Ninja came out recently. And it's sort of an exercise in, in taking an, a hand-drawn aesthetic and following it all the way through um, to a great effect. So in order to create art for a video game, you've got to understand what's going to look good in the game engine. What's going to look good, look good in the hands of the player? That's the trick. Nothing from these other media will make for a great art style for a video game if you take it wholesale. Um, Instead, you've got to look at this stuff uh, and do look at it, but look at it through the lenses of game art. You absorb and create. If you take these different artistic media, you can sort of try and break them down into different components, different elements, which I've half-acidly tried to do here. Um, and I'm not talking about how 
movies are made or how games are made. I'm talking about when you see the final rendered frame on the screen, what are the stylistic elements that make up that frame? Game ha games have some overlap, but they break down differently from the other media. For example, in comics and film, composition is a very powerful element. Um, a good example is, is storyboarding is, is such a fantastic tool for developing a film because the composition can do so much to tell the story. And of course in video games, often the player is in enough control that we can't consider it a dominant stylistic element. So let's look at what is important to game art. When we think about modeling, what we're really sort of breaking it down into is a silhouette and shadow, and um, those create shapes. And we spend a lot of time thinking about silhouette with characters, because in a video game, often you approach a character, it's tiny on the screen, it's 20 pixels high, and you need to be able to read that character and tell something about the story from that character. In texturing, what we're really talking about is color and detail. In the NES days, they had hardware-enforced palette limitations. They couldn't go above a certain number of colors. And in, in my opinion, that's a lot of the retro appeal of those games, is that they had to make strong color palette choices. And to me, this is an example that you can take almost all of the, the pixel art patterning out of these characters and present them almost just as color palettes, and you can still have recognizable characters. Um, another example is the D-Makes. This has uh, been going around for a few years. Tig's Horse had a competition a couple of years ago. This is when you take a modern game and reimagine it as it might have been uh, in, a, in an early generation. And we people started making these D-Makes. Um, I thought it was interesting that a lot of the ones that made for the strongest D-Makes were the ones with the most well-defined color palettes. So Team Fortress 2 has an extremely well-defined color palette, and it makes for an awesome D-make. Um, detail. So I worked on MMOs for a long time, and EverQuest 2 and, and World of Warcraft came out about the same time. And uh, when you're working on an MMO, there's tons of stuff that you can't do. There's so much going on that you're very limited on what you can put on the screen. And the developers on EverQuest 2 kind of approach that problem by saying, we'll take things like the characters and we'll divide their outfits up into different materials and then we'll tile a texture across it. So that way we can get tons of detail on the character, which is a departure from how characters are normally painted, more like a single canvas. And they got lots of detail. Um, and World of Warcraft kind of took an opposite approach, which was embracing the fact that they were going to have blurry textures um, and working with their, the Blizzard studio art style to come up with something that was consistent. And to me, when uh, I was being previewed and there were screenshots and I thought, you know, why can't they get crisper textures? But then when I played the game, the fact that that art direction was delivered consistently meant that you could accept it. It created its own internal believability um, and it really worked for them. So because we can't use composition so much to direct the player's eye, detail becomes a surrogate for game artists. By pulling detail out of what we don't want the player to care about, we can help guide them to look at what is important in the game. Um, if we bring color and detail together, this is it's Kazuo Oga. He's a background painter for the Studio Ghibli films. So his entire job is to paint the stuff that's not the focus, right? Um, to me, he's a master of sort of selective detail, suggesting detail. Here's a rock from Princess Mononoke. It's brush strokes, but you get that it's a rock. And that's all that matters, because you really want to look past that rock to the characters. Here's a rock from Crisis. See, you know, it's just a rock, but you, you can make choices about what's going to fit better in your game. More of this 
because he's awesome. Um, silhouette and color. This is Dermot Power, a concept artist. Um, I, I think his concept art is fantastic. It's, it's almost entirely silhouette and color palettes. But he suggests a ton of character. He suggests the detail. He doesn't paint it all in. That's what's most important for his character designs. He doesn't. He leaves out lighting and a bunch of other stuff I'm about to talk about, but it, that's because it's not important for what he's doing. Lighting is, is um, one thing that is really the same between games and other media. So by creating areas of dark and light, you can draw attention, create contrast, and draw the eye where you're where you want to. I read this book recently, Painting with Light by John Alton. It's an old book, predates video games, but everything in it still is applicable to building video games. Um, shading is how surfaces react to light. Um, and I thought of one example of how uh, we could show the impact of this, which is, this is Battlefield 1942, and this is Battlefield 3. Battlefield 3 is an amazing looking game. Um, but if you look at the characters, the shapes aren't that different. There's a little bit more detail in Battlefield 3. The color palette's pretty much the same. What you're getting a lot of is great shaders, at, um, atmosphere, ambient occlusion, Fresnel on the cloth, all kinds of effects come together to make it feel more real. And that's a lot of technical stuff, but when you're building a game, the artists are working with the programmers, making the decisions about how are these surfaces going to react to light. So the fundamental challenge of animation in games is that the player wants to press that button and have an action happen. Um, and we already talked about the Uncanny Valley and, and the, how the storytelling bits can drive your animation style. Um, but one thing that we can do in games, and we get better at this every year, is blending more procedural and simulation effects to, to lend a realness to the, to the animation. Um, uh, this is Sudomori Dreams, which is like a, it's fully biometric simulation on the characters. And it's hilarious. I'm not, quite good. Just, I'm not very scared of my fear. <laughs> So it's two up to you. Okay. I think. So we bow, 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 and then, then move forward. And then touch. Uh, uh, take that! <laughs> yeah, I won. That was me. That was my round. Okay, next round. Uh, so it's two, two, one to you. What is it? Best of how many? How many can we possibly okay. do of these? Oh! <laughs> oh a flying air punch. So, you might say that this this game has no art style that it's all just programmer art um, and that the programmer art hurts it but I think the animation is so authentic feeling that because of all that technical work that went into it that it's actually very stylish and hilarious um, exposure uh, is sort of a relatively new development in game art um, that we started treating our 3D camera is more like real cameras and thinking about exposure. Uh, so earlier I said that pixel art was like painting a canvas with Legos. Uh, making a 3D game these days is sort of like building a little 3D diorama world and then photographing it, which is, this artist's name is Kim Kiever. This is what she does. She makes like fish tanks and fills them with dioramas and squirts liquids in there to make them look like clouds. I think it's a lot like building a video game, personally. Um, so just like real cameras, you can have bad cameras and good cameras, and they make a difference. And I won't go into the technical side of that, but that's kind of the first step in thinking about the effect that exposure is having on your art style. And then on top of that, once you've got a good exposure, you've got a color grade. And that's more of an emotional component. Um, and all of those exposure elements, to me, are about simulating the eye. So 
when you're outside and, and you feel the sun on your face, it's hot. If you look at the sun, it physically hurts your eye. Um, and bloom and things like this, to me, are about giving you a visual cue that this is bright to kind of give you that same feeling and sensation. Another example, uh, moonlight looks blue. It's not actually blue. The moon is gray, the sun is yellow. Moonlight is not blue, but because of the way our eyes see in low light, it appears blue. So we color grade night shots to be blue. So, If you put all these elements together, you have a style. In Skyrim's case, our style was epic reality. Um, so we tried to use a lot of strong real world reference for most of these things, but we also definitely stylized in order to direct the player's attention appropriately. And last part, how to pull all this together and arrive at a style. Um, if you were to draw some conclusions from all of this, it's that game art is nothing special without the real-time rendering technology that enables it or the gameplay that makes it matter. It can get depressing as a game artist to kind of get a sense for all these constraints and limitations you're up against. And most of my talk has really just been bitching about the stuff that I don't get to do. Um, but of course, the reality is that it's that interactivity that makes game art great, that ability to sort of walk through a world and experience it. Um, and everything I've said so far is theory. When you actually set out to make a game, you don't have your technology, usually, or really ever. You don't necessarily know what your gameplay is going to be. Um, game development is a process of discovery. Uh, at Bethesda Game Studios, we have this mantra that great games are played, not made. And what that means is that you can talk all you want at the beginning of making a game and it doesn't mean anything until you sit down and play those ideas and then you have the opportunity to learn from that and make something good. So it would be a mistake to sit down and paint a bunch of concept art and say here's the visual art style um, and not expect to put that in the game and learn from it. Um, so just like gameplay and technology, building game art is a process of trial and error and discovery. Here's some examples of some iconic games. Um, this is pretty rare, I think, actually, to find these early screenshots when the game looked like shit. Usually, game developers don't want to release those. So it's cool to see them when it happens. Makes you feel better when your game looks like shit and it hasn't come out yet. The kid has a hope. Um, so, of course, you can't get great art direction through uh, pure random experimentation. I talked about uh, pixel art, uh, triangles of style, landscapes of inspiration, lenses. And I want to finish up with uh, vector plots of art direction. So there's a lot of artists working on the average game, and it's to everyone's benefit to get those artists thinking expressively. You're not going to get any style if you reduce art production to a mechanical pipeline. But on the other hand, you've got to get those artists working together. Without consistency in the art, you don't have a style. So here's how I think about it. Uh, it's like each artist is a vector, and if they're all going, in different directions, then those vectors sum to nothing. But if you can get everybody oriented, aligned, pointed in the same direction, those vectors sum to one strong force. And this is what I th think of in my head when I hear the term art direction. If you can get your style vector aligned to your gameplay vector, and your technology vector, and they're all going to the same place, then you've created a world, an internally consistent reality that if you deliver it with a steady hand, uh, 
allows players to immerse themselves, and that is what's going to make for an amazing game experience. So that's it.